Our next speaker is Dr. George Jallo, our surgeon. Um, uh, Dr. Jallo um, is a prof he really is a professor of uh, neurosurgery at Hopkins. He's the director of pediatric neurosurgery. Um, actually, the, the timing anymore. of the music the timing of the music is pretty good. Um, we have a real you know we're trying to get some of the music piped in here a little bit too to really get the rally going. Um, George did his uh, uh, post medical school training at NYU and he's been at Hopkins since 2004. Three, 2003. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Jow is gonna to talk to us about um, different, again, this is a request of the families, talk about different variations on the theme of the disconnection surgeries. So what I wanna talk about, I guess, uh, as Adam said, is really hemispherectomy and its variations. So, uh, you know, just a, a brief definition when, you know, when everyone's saying, oh, we're having a hemispherectomy, uh, what is it? Really, you know, everyone says, oh, we're just cutting out the hemisphere. Really, it's just the removal or the disconnection. Bec and, that, and that's where the confusion arises. You know, just because you're having a hemispherectomy doesn't mean that you're taking out that whole half side or that hemisphere. Uh, it could be just the, the disconnection of that hemisphere from the, surround the, the remaining brain. And it's for the treatment of medically uh, intractable epilepsy. And you know, there are many techniques uh, that exist, but let, I'll give you a little history about it. The first hemispherectomy was done in 1928 in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins. It was done by uh, probably the second neurosurgeon in the United States. The first one was uh, the father of neurosurgery was at Hopkins, Har Harvey Cushing. His pupil or his student was Walter Dandy, uh, and he took over the neurosurgery in Baltimore at Hopkins where I'd say, you know, the, the most ad advances at that time were coming out of here. And what he did was he did a hemispherectomy in patients, not for seizures, uh, didn't understand it at that time. They really did it for brain tumors. They said, oh, we don't have any effective uh, treatment for these tumors, the pa our patients are dying. And um, he went on the, on the edge and said, I'm gonna take out that whole side and see if we can cure that brain tumor. Well, he did the five patients, they all did, they improved. However, unfortunately, all their tumors recurred. And as one would expect with a malignant tumor, just because you take out uh, one side of the brain, it doesn't mean that there are cells on the other side, and that grew, they grew, and eventually all the patients died. But w what he did was he set out and paved the way that you can actually take out half of the brain uh, with some risks, but with, good, with a good outcome. And then it wasn't for, for another 10 years that uh, a, a surgeon, McKenzie, did the first hemispherectomy for seizures. And it was really based on Walter Dandy's work, saying, wow, you know, the, the tumors that you did, these patients didn't, no longer had seizures, so maybe we should just do the operation for seizures. And it, he had very good results. However, the first report in children took about another 20 years, so we're talking 1950, and there's an experience uh, with 12 children, and they did the hemispherectomy, and they had a dramatic reduction in seizures, and it was the first report that showed improvement in their cognitive, as well as their behavioral uh, uh, personality following the operation. And then it caught wind, you know, once you publish a few papers in, in the scientific literature, everyone wants to try it, and you can see that 53, 54, 55, 56, many papers were being published on hemispherectomy. And it, it, it took fire, you know, everyone was doing it. It was being done at many centers across the globe at this point. However, uh, in the 60s, there's a paper that was then published saying that patients do well after the hemispherectomy, but then there are some long-term complications with it. Uh, and, there's a, and there's this condition that they called persistent intracranial bleeding as a complication of the hemispherectomy, or they called it was superficial cerebral hemosiderosis. Patients did well for years, and then with these recurrent bleeds, there was scarring on the good half of the brain, and this led to cognitive decline and dysfunction, and the, in that these patients were doing worse in the long term. And then it fell, then, as everything else in the world, hemispherectomy falls out of favor and says, all right, let's stop doing hemispherectomies. We've got to figure out another way to treat these uh, children and adults uh, with seizures. So then, you know, again, we're fortunate enough that we get into the 1970s, and because of these complications, uh, Rasmussen, another neurosurgeon, said, you know, there's got to be a simpler method to do that will get the same results but avoid the complications and the risks that's associated with that 
anatomical hemispherectomy that were cutting the brain. And in 1974, he made a modification to that, and what he really called it was just a functional hemispherectomy, just disconnecting that part of the brain uh, from the surrounding, the other side, in hopes of controlling the seizures. And then there are many other modifications in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000. They called it periinsular hemispheric, functional hemispherectomy, a hemispheric deafferentation, modified functional hemidecortication that is being done here in Baltimore, and the vertical hemispherotomy. And let me just, what, what I want to talk about is some of the, the more common procedures, not all those that I've just listed. The first one's the anatomical, and that's, that's the classic hemispherectomy where, you, where we're cutting one half of the brain. The only thing that we're preserving on that side is really the basal ganglia and the thalamus in hopes of preserving some of the motor function there. But every, every other part of the brain on that diseased side is going to be removed. However, this is, the, this is the pure anatomical. It's got the highest chance of blood loss. There's it's probably got the, little high, the highest risk for hydrocephalus, but it is the most certain procedure for disconnection because we're removing all the brain uh, that could possibly be uh, causing these, uh, epile these discharges. And this is what it looks like. I don't want to gross anybody out, but essentially, all, if you look at the brain, we're looking at the brain straight on. The eyes would be here. Here's one half of the brain. Here's the other half. And essentially, we're taking everything out along these lines. And we're doing this. If you're looking at it straight on in the sagittal on the MRs that you would see, we're essentially cutting everything out on one side except leaving the other side. And this is what the full brain looks like. And then after the anatomical, it's just an empty cavity. Uh, here, and this is the deep structures, the basal ganglia that connects uh, uh, the one side to the other side, but everything else is gone in an anatomical uh, disconnection. And on your MRI, if you have the pre-op MRI, uh, the spinal fluid here looks white, and this is what one side of the brain looks like, and then with the anatomical, there's nothing there, it's just blank, and it gets filled up with, with spinal fluid, so it looks white just like the, the, the CSF uh, space. So that's the pure anatomical, and if we look at it, uh, sorry, this is the basal ganglia that's preserved deep down, but everything else, it should be just fluid that's filling that space. And in that coronal section, as I said earlier, again, here's the basal ganglia, the thalamus going down, everything else is gone, and it's, it's white. So that's your anatomical. So that's the simplest, you know, way to describe that, you're removing, you get half that brain completely removed. The other uh, more common one is that functional that some people uh, get. And there, there again, as I said, this was introduced in the mid-1974, and the question is, there are many variations on how you do it, depending upon the center that you go to or the surgeon uh, and their experience. But what it involves really is, involves getting access to the connection pathways, the corpus callosum, and some of the other pathways in the frontal lobe, as well as in the occipital lobe that connect one side to the other side. And, and, and depending upon the center that you're at, many people can access it from the top, and this is just a quarter that goes down, and then they're disconnecting it here in the middle, centrally, and then down, deep down in the temporal lobe. The other way to do it, is just approach it from the side. And this is, again, just a lateral approach to get to the same area. You're doing the same procedure. Some go from the top, others go from the side. Now, you ask me, well, which one's better? There's really no, it, it depends upon the surgeon's experience. It also depends upon on, on that patient or that child or that adult in which approach you, you're gonna take. If you have someone that may have a stroke that's causing seizures, they may already have a corridor to this. If this part has already been infarcted or, or dead, that brain tissue is dead, it gives you an easy access to go from the, from the top down. If it's in the, in the area of the middle cerebral artery that, that's had a stroke in utero, uh, this area in the middle, it, there's gonna be very little brain tissue to get to, so that's your corridor to get in here. So, you know, which approach you go from the top or from the side, again, depends upon the, the an, not anatomy and the etiology of the seizures as well as the surgical preference. Now, um, it is very difficult, it's a little more difficult to do this approach 
in some of the conditions such as hemimegalencephaly where the brain's really full and expanded because that's a lot of brain that you have to get to uh, and this to get to these areas just to do the disconnections. So uh, again, again, it will depend upon the anatomy as well as the, uh, the etiology of the seizures. Now, this is just some illustrations I want to show you. Again, here's the anatomical if we look at it, and if you want to see it, the anatomical. One side of the brain is all removed. And as I showed you on those MRIs, this is the artist's depiction. And the functional, as I showed earlier, you're just, you just need an access to the midline structures or the connections, both in the frontal as well as in the occipital lobe. You leave a lot of the brain, but you're disconnecting the connections. And in the hemispherotomy or the, the lateral approach, we're going from the side to do the same thing as the functional, but we're taking out a little more brain just to give us a little more window to safely access this and disconnect the brain. And uh, on MRIs, as I showed earlier, this is what, what you would see and how much brain is preserved in all these approaches. Um, and just to go back as, again, the artist's illustration. So what's, you know, what are the results? At the end of the day, um, really, the seizures, the seizure-free rate, and this is a paper that was just published uh, in 2014, and it looked at a review of, of, of about 1,000, uh, uh, it was about 1,000 patients that they looked at over many years, looking at the hemispherectomy, the functional approach, the anatomic or the hemidecortication, and the seizure-free rate, and essentially, it's about the same across all categories. Um, you know, it might be a little better with the anatomic, uh, and a little less with the hemodeutocortication, but overall, it's very similar. Now, what's, what, what they don't get into is they looked at the papers, but what they don't understand, what they really didn't delve into is why, was, why were some of the groups doing more anatomical hemispherectomies uh, versus the functional? And really, the reason for that is the underlying condition. And they didn't look at that in this paper to analyze that because they couldn't. They were just reading the literature. And when you, when you looked at it, and Chris did share the risk of hydrocephalus uh, with, with the procedures. Uh, what I will say is you know, the, the risk of hydrocephalus really is highest for the anatomical. It could be, it's as high as 30, as in, in that paper that uh, Adam was involved in, it, it was, uh, and this is a review of all the literature, and not just the current, uh, it could be as high as 30% with an anatomical hemispherectomy, whereas the functional or the hemispherotomies, uh, the risk of hydrocephalus was about 10%. And th I think the reason for that really is the biggest risk for the anatomical is the blood loss and uh, the blood products during the resection can cause scarring for, the, for that brain, to, for that brain's ability to reabsorb the spinal fluid that's being made. Whereas in the, the functional and the, the, hemisp the, uh, the hemispheronomy approach, uh, bleeding is much less. And, and classically, they also leave a drain in there for a few days, up to a week or 10 days to allow the blood products and the debris to get washed out to try to prevent scarring of the arachnoid granulations. That's what, in our brains, reabsorbs the spinal fluid that we're making, whereas in the anatomical, it's much less likely that we leave a drain in, and over time, those channels get scarred in, and then those children and adults lose the ability to reabsorb the fluid that they're making, and in turn, develop uh, hydrocephalus. So that's uh, the theory. And I guess just to conclude, really, what I will say is that hemispherectomy is a highly effective for the treatment of refractory epilepsy in the pediatric uh, age group. While the type of hemispherectomy does not influence the outcome of seizures, the, hem the procedure are associated with if a, the hemispherotomies, the functionals are more associated with a more favorable complication uh, profile. And as I said earlier, that the etiology really of the seizures does play a factor in that the developmental etiologies have worse outcomes than the acquired or the progressive etiologies regardless of the uh, technique uh, used for the resection.